So welcome to this session. This is a conversation between myself, Isabel Carlyle, sitting in South Devon, and John Thackera, sitting in the south of France, more or less the south of France. And we're going to introduce ourselves. We're going to talk about bioregioning. So John and I have been talking about bioregioning for at least four years and uh, trying to figure out what is it? What would people be doing in a bioregion? How would they do it? What skills would they need to do that? And then we, uh, John in particular, is going to give us some examples of where he sees bioregioning happening around the world. I'll give examples of what we've done in South Devon and link it back to bioregioning. And then we're going to open up this conversation to all of you. We'd love to hear from all of you. So that's going to be the shape of this um, session. It's going to go on to the top of the hour. So we've got about 55 minutes. So John, I'm going to hand over to you first to introduce yourself and say a little bit about how you got to into bioregioning. Like where did you discover that concept and why did it grab you? Well, I have spent most of my life as a writer and a curator struggling to understand why people didn't listen when I wagged my finger at them about how terrible they were treating the planet. And in the last third of my working career, I guess I came to the conclusion that people don't tend to respond well when you lecture them about their wickedness or order them to behave in a different way. Um, people tend to behave differently when their circumstances change. And so I came across bioregioning when I was trying to looking for examples of where people were connected to nature, not just in their heads, um, and not because they were part of some believer group, but because their daily life connected them with places and the relationship with places in a rather natural way. And that indeed is when I read Robert Thayer's book and lots of other people started to tell me about the word bioregion. And then I guess, Isabel, you and I coincided at one or two seminars at Schumacher College in England, which has, a, I guess, a long history um, of association with the word, even if they don't use it in all their language. And one of the mysteries to this day to me is this very strangely patchy way in which bioregioning manifests itself. So there's a the group in northwest of the United States, so there's a thing called the curriculum of the bioregion, which is like an incredible iceberg of materials and classes and curriculums and all sorts of things which has never kind of left northwestern United States I can, as far as I can tell maybe you all know about that but I think it's a word and a practice that seems to be rather regional so maybe that's a healthy sign so bioregionalists are not you know innately committed to becoming global about it which is maybe as it should be um, so that's a kind of potted history um, this picture is a provocation for our discussion in a way because the the paper that uh, Robert kind of referred to and which I wrote four years ago was an attempt to explain and explore the subject of bioregioning in China. It's a Soros commissioned by a Chinese university in their journal. And what immediately became clear there was two things. One is that people do bioregioning but using other words to describe the activity. Uh, but secondly, that there are different scales of geographical scales and different time scales that people uh, feel comfortable with or have arrived at that I personally had not been much aware of. So that although I read with this evening and this summit is about the bioregion, I think that the one of the interesting and exciting dynamics to me is people looking at different scales connecting with place that maybe weren't evident before. And then what I'll do in the next five minutes after the first five minutes is look at the different ways in which people come to this from an ecological point of view in terms of restoration of places, in, you know, ecological restoration, but also the social and economic side, which I think is slowly emerging. But again, it's very evident to me that around the world, people see the word and react to it in different ways. Um, and the big backstory to me that, makes our summit so important, but also so perplexing in some ways, is that there's a vast world of people doing similar sounding things for rather different reasons, namely the monitoring of the planet at different scales, um, for looking for ways to measure the health of places, the health of soils, the health of rivers and so on, or the health of the, the oceans. Most of that is driven by the demand from the nature finance uh, system 
for metrics to measure the before and after health of regions and places, um, which raises many questions, obviously. But I just wanted to make the point that in looking at what is happening about bioregions, there's this universe of rather highly technical and highly capitalized activities that probably don't think much about bioregioning at all with that word, but they, their, their outputs and their activities overlap with our own. And the other thing that's happened in the years since I've heard the word bioregion and the notion of a frame around living systems that we can relate to is the realization that 99% of life is invisible. And so that if we're going to have activities and practices that um, connect us to living things in a more visceral and embodied way, one of the interesting challenges, what do we do about the, the invisible life that is all around us and that people like me for certain have tended not to think about at all until rather recently. So the invisible lives um, around us is another dimension I think is making things interestingly complicated. Um, and just to be aware, and this is something which was brought home to me in China where I've been teaching and researching a bit, is the sheer scale of the technology being used to monitor living systems at different scales in different ways. And I kind of think that, of course, a lot of this is driven by questionable objectives and logics, but it actually is there as a sort of substrate that we can use. So I suggest to myself as much to, to anybody else that there is value there that we can dip into if the opportunity arises. And that when we talk about restoring lands, or restoring ecosystems or restoring bioregions, there will be all sorts of opportunities to use new techniques and technologies that people like myself, and I think in the bioregional movement, we tend to kind of say, this is not our story. We are not a tech community. We're a nature community or we're a spiritual community. Um, I just think we need to be aware that there's a lot of practical tools out there that can maybe be a point of contact with other actors in our region, even if we don't want to embrace them wholesale. And I learned about this two weeks ago, a whole building of people in Exeter in the UK with vast um, amounts of computing power being used to test the health of a, of a region and turn it into this kind of data. It is deeply fascinating to those guys. They're deeply not fascinated by the word bioregioning, but our worlds you know, overlap so much. So there's a kind of missing catalytic moment to be had to kind of get ourselves into the same room as these guys. Uh, and then just to say that the inspiration that I've had in meeting people doing monitoring of places and bioregions, and for, I'm sure that for many of you, the, the, the citizen science activities is where people combine the, the tools that are coming along with new techniques, but also the physically being out there in the places. And I think that's where I've seen people of all ages, not just these school students, really getting so inspired by the potential of making places healthier as a meaningful focus for their work in their adult life. Um, so the world of the tech and the gadget behind it, to, to my satisfaction, are, are converging in a rather exciting and um, I think rather inspiring way. And to finish uh, my quick run through the maybe unexpected, the tools and the techniques that are out there, this is um, at MIT where some people have said it's very important to have compost inside cities as well as in outside or in our gardens. How do we measure the temperature and the well-being of an urban and municipal compost heap? Answer with gadgets and the Internet of Things, which is what you're looking at here. And I just looked, I stared at this for a long time when I was shown it, and I said, am I for this or am I against it? And insofar as it connected engineers with compost, I decided it, I was in favor of it. Um, and then I learned about these teachers who use the tea bag index. I don't know how many of you have heard the tea bag index. This is uh, a way to test the decomposition of organic matter in soil using the analog of tea bags that you put into the soil and then you put them in for a week, take them out again and decide um, what it teaches you. I've seen a two groups of stool, school students doing this now. I don't actually think I can interpret the results, but 
since I, people like me always complain that we don't touch the soil enough, it's all happening out there if we just look perhaps in unexpected places. I'm going to jump over these two pictures to my three examples, because in this collection of, uh, basically, I'm a, I skim over the surface of things, as you'll have noticed by now. I, by skimming over the surface, I encounter people who are thinking about our subject from interestingly different worlds. And the notion of a life world, uh, which we heard about from Robert earlier and his book, um, is a very uh, big issue in nursing. So nurses drawing on philosophy, drawing on the critical, uh, yeah, the dysfunction of the global the biomedical system, uh, for them, their whole kind of theory of nursing and their practice of nursing is that care means embodied relational understanding. This is to researchers. And for me, that's where I've got to in the kind of attempts to make bioregioning a real and lived reality. And so I'll show you the three examples that I think embody uh, these uh, principles of embodied understanding rather than just theoretical. This is the Camargue by a region in France, which some of you may know, it's a very uh, diverse and wonderful uh, location, in which is a place called Atelier Luma, in these former railway buildings, which has been for seven years studying and doing physical design experiments. It's the by region, I'm going to blow my picture all over it, but this is their brand new building. 6,000 square meter bioregional design lab in which people study uh, and make physical prototypes of ways to use the natural and cultural resources of their bioregion. They have historians looking at the history of rice, which is a part of the, they have designers looking at the history and future of textiles. And they have groups of people uh, doing the storying of place in a, but I think it's a miraculously kind of conventional way. They draw pictures to describe the results of their in depth research using black and white drawings. This book is available online um, as an issue, and I do recommend it because it takes the whole Camargue bioregion and people look at it through these different words that you see there. And so everything from the life of the eel as it passes through the bioregion, um, the different wetlands that the Camargue bioregion represents and includes, different forms of uh, pastoralism and so on. And so this atlas are done in black and white drawings by people spending time there looking in great detail at the science, but also in the place, for me, is a very powerful way to provide an artifact to get everybody's attention. And then this is the key to my story, is that uh, they are not just studying and researching, they're now making products from, as a result of their researches. This is a group of people, architects and builders who are looking at ways to use the salt, which is a lot of, uh, to make salt bricks, which, and brick things, which are very ecologically good. And another group is looking at the straw that is a byproduct of rice and turning it into the kind of panels that we'll use to retrofit all the empty offices of the region. That was that. I'm just going to take a bit more time, but five more minutes. Over to Scotland, where a project called Highlands Building is not, strictly speaking, located in a bioregion, but it is a kind of bigger state. It's actually two or three states now, where <clears throat> a foundation is looking at nature recovery and community possibilities through rewilding, which uh, raises many questions, and I don't know whether we're doing the rewilding discussion today. The point is that they are using a remarkable uh, array of very precise techniques to make a baseline about how healthy is their region. So everything from on the left, the depth of peat, you know, meter by meter on the estate, um, in the middle, there's a different forms of vegetation by different kinds of classification, at the lot of the different habitats at the bottom and so on. You all the um, readings and measurements with people more or less on hands knees going meter by meter to learn about things, combined with using very advanced techniques like e DNA analysis, 
so that when they have a bit of damaged or neglected land, they find out what used to live there hundreds or thousands of years ago using these very cool modern techniques. Uh, so what I like about it is that it's very different, if you remember those pictures at the beginning, from these kind of satellite views of landscapes that the mineral explorers or extractors are looking at, or even the natural capital crowd. They make, they are very proud of their satellites that can plot every square meter. I think there's a difference in degree between what the kind of top-down looking at places involves and what the scientists and the crawling around on the hands and knees. And third, and finally, to Sweden, where I wanted to kind of just show how the social and the ecological combine when people say, we're not just here to kind of appreciate our place, we want to see what kind of future we can create by combining assets that may have been neglected or overlooked. Otherwise, they just discover what is there and then explore what if we did different types of activity to connect activities and actors. And this is on an island in the middle of, I mean, on a site in the middle of Sweden, which is part of their historically a heavily forested area, now lightly forested. But for seven or eight years now, we've been spending time in that place, collecting examples of all the things that used to happen there, the things that could happen in the future. I made a mistake and put an Italian map on the right. The point is, this is a practice in which um, we are seeing right now, and as you will ask me to say, what I'm seeing out there, over seven or eight years, what began as a kind of rather enjoyable, kind of enhanced tourism to this part of Sweden and looking at the beautiful landscapes and meeting some exotic farmers, in seven years, it's now become a rather serious hub for uh, developing practical futures for that region. So what you see on this table are some potatoes and some bread, but the uh, people around that table are bakers, farmers, seed savers, um, people looking at the future of the cookery schools, people looking at the future of agriculture, policymakers from rather small municipalities. Uh, there's like eight people around the table and they all have about four jobs. So this, to my satisfaction, is where the notion of a bioregional lab like the other two, starts to get serious. It's done the research, done the understanding, but now it's kind of prototyping activities for the future. So uh, I hope I didn't steal too much of your time. Those are my three, my two examples, and I'll stop at that point, I think, and hand over to Isabel. John, thank you very much. You're always very good at knowing what's out there. I learned such a lot from all these big different examples. So uh, as I mentioned, John and I had conversations about what bioregioning is. And from that, I and my colleague in this bioregion, Jane Brady, uh, created this graphic that I'm going to show you now. And then I'm going to, I, I'm going to share my screen. I'm also then going to go into a very brief slide deck to show you how we are um, working into these examples here in South Devon. So I hope you can see that very clearly. If I can make it a bit bigger for you. Um, let's see. I think that's pretty good, isn't it? So here we are. So we created our nine cards and these nine cards summed up what we thought that the uh, actions of bioregional activators or regenerators might be and the kind of capacities they'd be bringing to this work. So I won't um, read out loud what's on the screen because I think you can probably see it quite clearly. It's quite big there. But certainly in thinking about how to work in the bioregion and also how you might train people to do this bioregional work in the future, what would be a package of learning for people who wanted to become bioregional practitioners. This is what we came up with. The work at the edges, see the whole, pay attention to systems. Map for vitality, prototype and learn, collaborate. Establish baselines, tell how-to stories and share governance. 
this uh, graphic is has a Creative Commons license on it. It's on our website. Anyone can download it and use it. Um, but let me now go into my slide deck and tell you how we're using that piece of um, inspiration, if you like, here in South Devon. So this is the first slide that I want to share with you. I, what I'm doing is I'm kind of charting our bi-regional journey here in South Devon. We really started work in about 2017 um, after a short course that John Thackeray and I and Pamela Mang and Joel Glansberg from, from Regenesis talk at Schumacher College back in 2016, which is called Bioregioning by Design. And out of that came the whole concept of the Bioregional Learning Center and the team that's been working with me on it. Um, but one of the first things we did was working with water. And what you see here is on the left, a photograph of a meeting of the South Devon Catchments Partnership. So the whole of, the, of England and part of Wales was divided up by one of our ministries, the Department for um, the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, I believe that's what it's called, um, into catchment partnerships. And our catchment partnership pretty much covers our bioregion. It, uh, we're pretty much mapped onto our catchment partnership. There are five rivers in our catchment partnership. And every so often people get together to talk about what's going on in South Devon. So that's what you see happening on the left. And we became more and more aware going to these meetings and working with the West Country Rivers Trust, that there was a huge gap. There were probably two huge gaps. One was that um, people working with rivers found it very difficult to make it possible for stakeholders in watersheds or river catchments, as we call them here, to uh, think in systems, to see systems and work in systems. And the other part that they were finding difficult was engaging communities. So we put our minds to work and we came up with the River Dart Charter and we um, trialed it at Dartington. So Dartington is quite a big estate, which is just upriver from where I am here in Totnes. The person at the, that time who was managing the land at Dartington said, well, come along here and try out your River Dart Charter here. So we made a River Dart Charter for the stretch of the River Dart that runs around the Dartington estate. And this is the top half, what it looks like. Again, you can download this off our website. I, we wanted to give moral rights to the river. It's not possible to give legal rights to a river here in the UK. There's no loophole in English law or UK law that enables us to do this. But what we wanted to do was to flip the relationship between people and water from being consumers to being stewards. So we gave moral rights to the river, as you can see. But we also gave communities who live next to the river the role and responsibility to uphold those rights. And if we went further down the document, we'd be able to see what the community named as being the primary assets that they associated with the river and that they were going to protect. And we did this whole dark charter creation over about um, four or five months, engaging with a huge number of people. I think it was over 1,200 people. We had lots of interactive events in order to make the charter. We all made it together. And what we want to do, of course, is to move the charter upstream and downstream. At the moment, it just encircles Dartington. We've got considerable, considerable pushback from the fishermen who live upstream, who are convinced that we were encouraging people to trespass on their land. So we're still... <laughs> We're still wrestling with that one. Yeah. Sounds familiar. <clears throat> so this is the next one. So one of the next things that we did after working on the River Dart Charter was to run a learning journey around South Devon. And we did this for a couple of reasons. One was that we wanted to build many more connections with the people who were leading the green shoots of resilience around South Devon and to actually go and see them and visit them. And the other was to do this kind of weaving between different parts of the bioregion. 
So on our learning journey, we went to four different places in our bioregion. And we also had a one day um, water uh, regeneration summit here in Totnes, which brought people from across the southwest of England to talk about what was happening with water and rivers and rainfall and so on here in the southwest. But we started our learning journey on day one by going to different farms and growing sites around Totnes. And this is a farm at Huxham's Cross, which did an extraordinary piece of work in regenerating soil from being very hard and compacted and lifeless in just three years through using biodynamic preparations to turning into what smelt and felt quite delicious, as you can see. And in the other three days of our learning journey, when we were traveling around, we went to Plymouth, which is a big um, local city on the sea, and we visited social enterprise projects there. We also looked at food growing by communities in the city, and we visited a solar power station. Uh, on the next day, we went up to Dartmoor, and we, with Southwest Water, our water company, we visited a reservoir that supplies people in South Devon with water, and we heard about what the water distribution system is like and what climate change is doing to that. And we also had uh, a lunch with Dartmoor farmers who told us about um, the challenges they're facing, both to do with um, climate change, but also the way our government here in the UK is uh, paying farmers to manage land they were talking to us about the, the past of the cultural history of farming, which has been going on on Dartmoor since um, for about 4,000 years in the same way that it's conducted right now and what the future would hold for them. And we were able to tell them about food deserts in Plymouth and they immediately offered to um, put meat that they'd been um, growing up on the moor into the food boxes of the people in Plymouth who uh, lacked fresh food. And the last day we went to a community on the coast who was being battered by storms regularly and the road was getting washed away. And they were going through a process of retreat from the sea and coming to terms with the fact that they would soon be living at a dead end. And we also visited Brixham, our local fishing harbor, which is the biggest fishing harbor in England. And uh, we talked to the harbor master there and heard about uh, bottom trawling and plastic fishing nets and reluctance of fishermen to do anything differently ever. Um, one of the um, aspects of bioregioning that we talk about is telling the story of your place. And we created a story of place for Northwest Plymouth in 2020, looking for patterns. Uh, in other sessions, I've been talking about how in story of place, you look for overlapping patterns, starting with deep time and geology, working your way all the way back up through social history and economic history, also looking at rainfall and fauna and flora up to the present day, looking at the consistencies to see if there's a story that can be told through all of these patterns overlaid on each other. And we came up with these three different patterns for Plymouth, Northwest Plymouth. And this was a project about reconnecting people who lived in housing estates to their urban streams. And you can see on the right, uh, the steps made by friends of um, that local woodland. And interestingly, that woodland grows hornbeam, which is what was used in, uh, in British warships for the masts and the, the parts of the ship that needed to be particularly solid and hard. I, this is uh, a piece of work that we did in 2021, the Devon Donut. Uh, we understood uh, from very early days on, talking to lots of different people about how you would do landscape scale regeneration, that we really needed a baseline to work from. And creating the Devon Donut with a whole team of people that grew to be 170 strong in a collective, we worked into this challenge of creating what we call contextualized indicators. So we didn't just want to kind of impose um, different um, sectors or domains or scenarios onto Devon, 
we wanted people in Devon to tell us what they thought was really important. So here you see coastal marine health, health and well-being, education. We came up with a way to uh, something that we could measure that would relate to the well-being of that particular domain. So in coastal marine health, we had an idea that we could measure the number of fishing vessels that were sailing out of Devon's harbors, the bottom trawling days per year. And we'd chosen that because we had read a paper that came out shortly before we did this work that said that bottom trawling was releasing as much carbon dioxide per annum as aviation was doing annually, globally. So we thought, aha, maybe we can kind of home in on that. But the harbour master pointed out to us quite rightly that naming and shaming fishing boats probably wasn't the right way to go. We we're going to alienate them. They might be more useful to count the number of marine protected areas because in demonstrating that we didn't have enough, we'd be able to go to the policymakers and say to them, this is going to be a game changer for us. We need to get more highly protected marine areas. So this kind of points to the work that we're heading into next in the South Devon bioregion, which is to uh, create uh, the next stage of understanding how data relates to governance and how local communities and civil society can be involved in governance of what um, Ellen Ostrom called common pool resources. So here we are paying attention to systems and seeing the whole. Uh, this is a map of the drinking water system in South Devon. Uh, interestingly, for many years, Southwest Water wouldn't share it with us with the actual names on it. They had to blank out all the names for security reasons. But when we did a project called Voices of the Dart this year, which was a saving water project, i.e. reducing water use in the face of climate change and working with communities along the River Dart, Southwest Water were kind enough to give us the map with the names on it. And you can see that, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but you've got pumping stations, you've got reservoirs, you've got rivers, and you've got pipes, and you've got water processing or water purification stations kind of dotted around this, this map that shows how, how everything joins up. And it was very interesting working with the communities, showing them that map, so that they could really see where their water comes from, because many people had never stopped to think about the fact that their drinking water comes out of rivers. They somehow thought it came from rainwater and reservoirs, but actually we have a lot of water that comes straight out of the river, and of course is treated before we actually use it. So those are the examples of bioregioning that we've been pursuing in South Devon. And of course, every time we put them into use, we learn from them. So it certainly isn't a kind of, it's not a done deal. We, um, we're constantly kind of finding our way, tiptoeing our way through. I, let me just kind of click this to exit. Exit that. I, so now we would like to open up the floor to all of you <clears throat> to ask questions and make observations and tell us what you think about what you've heard and about bioregioning. And I should say before we launch into that, that um, the way we think about bioregioning is that it's like commoning, that without bioregioning, a bioregion doesn't come into life and doesn't stay as a living entity and in the way that commoning keeps a commons alive. Well, one of the most interesting things, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. One of, the, one of the most wonderful things about what you both have been saying is that bioregioning is an action process. And that's what I liked about, about the word bioregioning. And I think, when I when I wrote Life Place, I had all these verbs in the chapters, you know, becoming and grounding, and yet it, and I never thought that you could put them all together and the word bioregioning. So I, when I read John's paper, it was like, aha, it all fits together. And I think that's that's one of the issues that people need to understand about bioregional theory and practice is that it's active. It, it's, it's, it's such an action oriented process. And, and uh, Isabel, your, your uh, tour 
of uh, South Devon and, and the, the, what did you call it? Uh, a learning journey. Yeah, the, the learning oh, journey. We, we did something similar in the Sacramento Valley area years ago when we were uh, working on our bioregional grant. We took people everywhere and uh, it's really important. I love the, um, the watershed map that's the real watershed. And, and we have the same issues in the United States. Nobody knows where the systems come from or go to. And it's been something I've been struggling with and, and trying to investigate all, all my career. So it's really delightful to hear both of you, um, you know, talk about these kinds of things and demonstrate them. It's just joyful. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much, Robert. It's about how, if this occurred purely at a horizontal citizen level, or whether you had informal or formal cooperation from uh, state officialdom. And in other words, the, the fraught relationship between bioregionalists or commoners doing this and the state which claims the political authority or legal authority over it and what sorts of rapprochement or not you've seen so far or where you want it to go? Very good question. So we got funding from our local water company, which is a very big water company, to do the Voices of the Dark project. So we were very pleased to be able to work with them. I mean, that was a kind of an aspect of engaging with the bigger system and getting the bigger system into dialogue with the smaller systems so they're able to hear each other. Mm -hmm. In terms of connecting with governance, Devon County Council played a role in the creation of the Devon Donut. However, I can't say we, we weren't doing that at bi-regional scale specifically. We did that at county scale because that was where the energy was. That's where people wanted it to go. I, I think one of the key things we wrestled with at the beginning was our legitimacy to do this work. And mm -hmm. would people take us seriously? And did we need that? And we were adamant that we weren't going to work at on the scale of political boundaries. We were going to cross political boundaries. So we weren't going to work with um, specifically with South Ham's district council, for instance, which is our local district council, because we work at a much bigger scale. So far, we haven't bumped into any problems, but that's probably because we haven't really rattled any cages and we we operate so much kind of in the in-between spaces, connecting things up by operating in the gaps and so on, that we haven't really bumped into work that um, the governance is doing. I think probably the opposite, in fact, because uh, our gov governments are so constrained. As you know, we live in the most centralized state in Europe. So mm -hmm. county councils are pretty much governed from Westminster. And certainly we've got a conservative controlled county council that it, you, you could almost imagine them kind of um, being under the conservative whip because they totally pursue the party line. And the county council can only do a set number of things. The regional council can only do a set number of things. For the regional council, it's, council is purely planning and roads and local health. And they can't, they don't go beyond that. And we obviously go way beyond that. I mean, so it's an interesting dialogue that we haven't really had to sit down and have. Uh, people know what we're doing, but we haven't bumped into it. They haven't stopped us in any way, <laughs> at least not yet. John, you were going to say something, and I interrupted yeah. you. No, you didn't. I, I went offline somewhere. Just to say, David, that um, I, in the, the Swedish example, we spent seven years basically not connecting much with local governments or even national agencies. It wasn't sort of lack of trying, but they just didn't really know what the hell we were talking about. <laughs> but this year, for the first time, um, we've actually made a connection with a local municipality, which took the initiative saying, what are you all doing? And by the way, we want to become a resilient municipality. How would we go about it? And might we work with you guys on it. So I don't know whether this is just fortuitous, but I have this theory that things happen when they're ready to happen. So there is an example of where we have always thought for seven years, we really ought to talk more to the local municipalities. And after in year seven, it happens. At the same time, Sweden nationally is launching a mission on food, 
which is heavily predicated on growing food in places that haven't been grown before. And so the, the national mission kind of apparatus is trying to get to grips with regions of potential as well. So I think that basically just by the passage of time and the, the, the crisis becoming more acute, then we will make these connections with these government uh, entities. Thanks, John. Killian, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I was just on it before John spoke, I was already noticing the, the patterns um, in that uh, what you did just went through describing is basically putting flesh on the bones of what, what I presented in 2012 as regenerative governance, where you have these, these fractal levels of decision making, right? And the only difference between what you're talking about and, and that is, is kind of as what John just said, he said, well, over time, we'll kind of do this. And what, what regenerative governance is suggesting is that, that that working at all the levels be intentional from, the, from right now. And then, but all the decisions you made, the ways you did things, that's what, that's what I always talk about is that's local. That's, that's local decision making that we can't cookie cutter. You know, we can suggest patterns and, and, and methodologies and stuff, but whether they will work here or work there, very local decision. And that's why I never talk about that, because that all is so local. But the pattern, that pattern of, of networking the bioregion, absolutely, that's universal, in my opinion. That's what we can do. And that's, that's why I keep saying, hey, let's do this. And we see that pattern everywhere I look. You see it with the, with the Quechua in Peru. You see it with the... Uh, you see it in in Charan in Mexico. You see it in with Swaraj um, in in India. You see it everywhere, and you, that's what you guys are doing. But we don't have a common way of talking about it, and so that framework maybe will give us a way of saying a framework to talk about it, and then say what you're doing is fleshing out the bones. But let's re recognize we need the bones. We need to consciously say let's get people in the individual community starting to talk, at least a few people, and get these you know local, then more regional, then more regional, then bioregional, then inter-bioregional. Thank you. I, I just wanted to share that. Both you, what you both shared made me just, the patterns are just so clear. It's beautiful. Thank you very much. Yes. And I like the way you're talking about patterns. I think it might be more useful than talking about principles even. So that, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Natalie. Hi, uh, thank you. I've been really enjoying uh, your talks. Um, I I have a question actually, Isabel, about your kind of little model that you presented with the different elements or the kind of different uh, approaches, I suppose, for doing this work. And what I really liked about that was how uh, accessible in terms of like language it feels, uh, even for people who might not be familiar or fully immersed in kind of this world or in kind of designing or regenerative approaches um, and I'm just curious of like whether you have uh, encountered people who are already used like finding it and apply and using it um, in different ways uh, how has that worked if, if so how is that working uh, if there's anything you can share around that we haven't specifically found people who put all of those different things together but when we observe what people are doing, we find that they're using two, three, four, five of those different ways. I, I guess what we did was really kind of look at what a thriving bioregion would look like. And then from that kind of figure out, well, what are the clusters of actions that you could kind of put underneath a particular competency? So some of my work that I did before I came into bioregioning was around learning and education, particularly with young adults and um, thinking about the competencies that they would need in order to take projects that they had ideas for, often kind of around in the domain of sustainability or transition towns or whatever, into being, uh, yeah, kind of like paths that they could use to create an income from. I suppose a lot of that has gone into thinking about the competencies that might be needed. But what we would love to do is start, would be to start teaching them and to really kind of bring people here and to see from the ground upwards, to kind of take people out into the projects we're doing and introduce them to all the different competencies that we're using. But I also think that people are doing a lot of this work, but it's not called bioregioning. It's, it's probably nothing new. It's just the way that we've started to combine it and think about it, which might be new. Christine. 
Um, yes, I, I don't know whether it was just um, getting to New Zealand, but I didn't get to the end of John's slide set. Um, I got as far as Scotland and I never saw any of the Swedish stuff. So I'm wondering with if, if in the recording that will happen. Um, no, it won't but, because there seemed to be a time lag. So John, I think it might be your internet connection, but yes, we never actually got to Sweden. There was a kind of time oh. delay on the slides, but John could try sharing those ones again. Yeah, we can't hear you, John. I'm sorry, I have a lot of material which I'll be very happy to share, not right this second, uh, because I do have an unstable connection. Um, what I said about Sweden um, in the slides, but also just now in the conversation, was that it took seven years for a kind of group of people who were looking around a region with great enthusiasm but didn't know the right people. It took seven years before we met people from local municipalities who were also interested in similar things but didn't know we existed, or if they did, they weren't sure what we were doing. So I think what Isabel just said was so important that people use different words. I mean, I don't know if you know about the Ojai watershed in, uh, is that in California? That's, yeah. they've never, used, but watersheds and watershed actions on a regional scale are all over the world which I think overlap a lot with what we've been talking about here. Absolutely. And the, the capabilities in the Ojai situation were, how do you get very diverse groups of people to sit around a, a table or a, a fire and discuss anything at all, when those people are golf club proprietors, activists, scientists, local politicians, all of whom previously just very hostile to each other. That is not something which comes naturally to most of us. That's things I suspect one of the capabilities that Isabel would want us all to learn to how to do it. Yes, and that's a follow-up question that I have for you, John, and that is what I saw with your presentations and so far as I saw it is that um, they seem to start with a, a mapping process and also Isabel's thing, there is a mapping process and that mapping process can be quite apolitical, if you like in that what you're doing, and it's the know your place thing, so that if you start with, rather than saying, we're going to fix this island or this watershed, if you start with, let us know our place better, from, from the micro up to the macro, um, which is what that lab in the Camargue is doing, which is awesome, um, then at that point you start engaging people who um, wouldn't think of what you're doing as some kind of activist political process, um, and feel they can engage. And Isabel was talking about recruiting the people from the Dartington estate who were prepared to, to do that. So you will get some buy-in from some people and eventually, as in your Swedish example, the, um, you know, the municipality will come to the party or the, the Devon Water people came to the party. So um, I'm thinking about this, you know, what you're saying is uh, like we all have such different cultural situations and I'm living in a country where the government is actually proposing to centralise um, water governance hmm. um, and, and actually set up four completely artificial regions of New Zealand, one of which comprises the whole of the South Island and the bottom part of the North Island, which is nuts. Um, and, you know, has no relationship to how the water actually flows. And this has just turned into a, into a racist bun fight because they're wanting to involve tangata whenua, the Māori people. Um, and some tangata whenua are seeing this as, as an opportunity for them, and others are just like, you know, they're scrabbling for a living like most of the rest of us, so they're not engaged. And the people who actually are living beside these streams are not and rivers are not having any say in how they're, they're being managed. And now the decisions are going to Wellington. And I'm just thinking like, where does one start? I think I've got a creek just, you know, a um, hundred yards away from me. Maybe I start there and with the local people, both Maori and non-Maori, let's see what we can do just as a microcosm and maybe, you know, spin it out from there. I don't know. It's just, um, I think what, what you've achieved is awesome. It's giving me patterns and designs. And I like this, the map, the pattern, those things are, um, those, those things are organic, if you know what I mean. I, I have trouble with design because that, that assumes that a human is deciding what's best for things. Whereas 
what they're doing in the command, looking at existing patterns. Um, that's that makes sense. So okay, enough from me. That's um, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, yeah, they were awesome, and I've learned a lot, and now I'm thinking a lot. Thank you very much, Christine. Roger, over to you. And I think that's going to be the last question before we wrap up. You're muted, Roger. I want to thank you both for this. It has been really interesting and and inspiring. Um, I'm I'm struck by what I just thinking about as a pattern of patterning from Lynn Ostrom to the work that David and Silky have done with a triad of commenting patterning um, and wondering what's gonna happen with the evolution of bioregioning patterning, patterning and how that might intersect with commenting patterns. Um, so maybe people could talk, talk to that, check. Thank you again. Hey, that's a fantastic question. I'm not sure I can talk to that like other people probably can. I think maybe we can discuss that in the call, our panel tomorrow, Isabel. Yeah, I'd love to. Because that's precisely uh, an issue that I'm very eager to learn more about. I mean, I've been soaking up a lot of things going, these kinds of conversations, trying to figure out what the synapses are that we need to invent, what the infrastructures are we need to invent. And then my question about how we connect with existing political and legal authorities which are either gonna be indifferent or hostile. Um, mm -hmm. All of those I think are things we need to think through to figure out how comedy might find its protected role in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, uh, it's all very much work in progress. So in the conversation that I had with Daniel Christian Val yesterday, we were trying to tease out what the, um, what the values, and at the time we yesterday we were talking about principles, I actually like patterns much better. What would the values and principles of bioregions be? i very wary of um, imposing them on mm -hmm. different bioregions, knowing that every bioregion is different, but thinking mm -hmm. that there are commonalities of practice. And certainly um, hearing the presentation that was given from the Amazon Sacred Headwaters Initiative, I found a lot of connection between what they were aiming to do in terms of data and governance of the bioregion related to what we're doing here in South Devon. So there clearly are commonalities. And as Killian was talking, I was also thinking about the Swaraj in India. So we had a great session with John, in fact, on Saturday with two people from India talking about Swaraj and bioregions in India. So there definitely are common patterns that link us all together, even though every bioregion is completely different and distinct. Here, here. So sadly, we should wrap up. Um, it's perfectly possible for people to go on talking in this room. I personally have to leave, but that doesn't mean you all have to leave if you want to keep going. It's the, formally the end of the session, so I'm gonna press stop on the recording.